Um, so I wanted to say a few <coughs> words about the thin disk model. Um, <coughs> so this is uh, the classical thin disk papers are Shakura <coughs> and Sunyayev, uh, 73, <coughs> Novikov, and Thorne, 73. <coughs> uh, and then there's a Linden Bell and Pringle. <coughs> uh, when is it? 74? 74. 74. <coughs> and uh, a Pringle <coughs> 1981, which is a very clear review of the uh, material. So if you read these, you should be in good shape. <coughs> um, so what, what, is the, what is in the, <coughs> in the thin disk models? So we picture a black hole <coughs> with a disk around it that ends at the ISCO. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, inside the ISCO is a region that's imagined to have very low density where the plasma just plunges into the black hole, so-called plunging region. <coughs> and then out here, um, the disk is in centrifugal equilibrium. So it's uh, orbiting with frequency omega equal to <coughs> square, square root of gm over r cubed. Uh, it is got a, a scale height h, which is small compared to the local radius. <coughs> so this is thin disk. <coughs> and uh, furthermore, in these models, uh, there's imagined to be only interior transport of angular momentum. So we don't exert any torques on the surface of the disk. We don't have magnetized winds carrying away angular momentum. <clears throat> we only have uh, what can be modeled as diffusive exchange of angular momentum between neighboring uh, rings in the disk. And this is often modeled using an effective viscosity. <clears throat> um, so the units of uh, viscosity are, kinematic viscosity, are uh, length times of velocity. And the only natural length scale here is the scale height. Only natural uh, velocity scale is the sound speed. It's the only game in town. <coughs> and then we multiply that by a dimensionless number alpha, which describes the strength <coughs> of the turbulence or intensity of the turbulence. So um, uh, the idea is you set this thing up, you turn it on, uh, and angular momentum flows outward, and uh, mass flows inward. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, I just want to describe a few uh, salient features of the model. So I'm not going to do the entire derivation. And I'm actually going to provide you with yet another Mathematica script, <clears throat> which automatically calculates every alpha disk model known to man or woman. Um, so it's uh, uh, what it winds up doing is giving surface density. <clears throat> okay, so this is integral of uh, rho through the through the disk, uh, central temperature, <clears throat> photospheric temperature or T effective, um, density at the midplane. Uh, it can even give magnetic field strength, <clears throat> uh, optical depth, and the ratio. of say gas pressure to radiation pressure. <clears throat> so uh, this all emerges from an assumed value for alpha, <clears throat> um, from an assumption that it's in a steady state, <clears throat> and from uh, uh, vertical hydrostatic equilibrium and radial uh, equilibrium, so the uh, uh, idea is that it's centrifugally supported. Okay, so once those ingredients are in, you, you pour these things in, you stir, 
uh, and you can get a solution for all these quantities. <coughs> and uh, uh, I spent most of my career trying to get away from the alpha model <coughs> somewhat unsuccessfully, um, so I'm not going to derive it. But let me write down <coughs> uh, an example solution <coughs> so you can get a sense for how this goes. Um, so uh, this is for a, a black hole. Uh, one finds central temperature 4.3, 10 to the 7 K, alpha to the minus 1 quarter, m to the minus 1 quarter. And here m is the mass scaled to one solar mass. <coughs> and uh, r in units of the gravitational radius <coughs> to the minus 3 eighths. OK, so this is for uh, a black hole that's accreting close to Eddington. <coughs> and uh, uh, this gives us central temperature, effective temperature. So the temperature at the center, of the, at the midplane of the disk, and temperature of the photosphere. Um, these, this looks impossible because the photospheric temperature is higher than the midplane temperature. <coughs> but um, that's because I, I haven't scaled this to appropriate. Uh, appropriately. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this <coughs> relation, which describes the effective temperature of the, the, the disk, you'll notice is independent of alpha. It contains no power law dependence on alpha. <coughs> and that's because uh, the uh, effective temperature is basically determined by an energy conservation relation. So if you're accreting at a certain, a certain rate, you need to release a certain amount of energy per unit area <coughs> in the disk, and that determines the effective temperature or alternatively the, the uh, surface brightness of the disk, uh, which is sigma t effective to the fourth. <coughs> um, we can also um, calculate uh, P gas over P rad. <coughs> and this turns out to be <coughs> it turns out to be rather small. <coughs> so uh, this implies that in uh, sort of stellar so, uh, mass black holes, <coughs> close to the ISCO, um, uh, uh, stellar mass black holes that are accreting close to the Eddington rate, the uh, radiation pressure dominates the gas pressure. So this tells you immediately that uh, uh, radiative interactions with the gas are dynamically important. <coughs> So, yeah, uh, we're here, 21 over 8. So, so don't write this down. Please don't write it down. I'm going to give you this Mathematica script, and you can just pull up the solution in there. OK. Maybe you don't use Mathematica. Anybody can use the command line. <laughs> OK. So. Um, uh, so you, you should be able to pull the solution out of that. <clears throat> All right, so, so this can, gives you a sense for sort of the power of the alpha model and why it has persisted for so long. Um, if you know what alpha is, uh, if the assumptions behind the alpha model are correct, that you only have this diffusive transport of uh, angular momentum, uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, if alpha is constant, then uh, this indeed is the run of uh, temperature and ratio of gas pressure to radiation pressure and so on uh, in the disk. So it's, it's powerful. It can give us uh, all the physical, the run of all these physical quantities inside the disk. <clears throat> okay. Um, part of the notion 
um, underlying the alpha model is that there's turbulence inside the disk, and I talked about that um, earlier, uh, and I showed you a simulation of uh, magnetically driven turbulence in a disk. And uh, I'm gonna uh, tell you where that comes from, uh, and in particular do the analysis of the mag magnetorotational instability very quickly in sort of uh, simplified form. <clears throat> so magnetorotational instability is a linear instability of a, a fully ionized uh, magnetized disk, and uh, it grows by exchanging angular momentum between fluid elements. So it's, it's really exactly what one needs uh, to drive uh, uh, turbulence inside accretion disks. <clears throat> so the, the physical picture uh, that one has is, say our black hole is here, and we have a disk here that starts out with a field line going through it. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the MRI tells us that this situation, where we have a nearly vertical field going through a disk, is linearly unstable. <clears throat> and it produces a uh, uh, streaming of the fluid by um, coupling together uh, fluid at different altitudes magnetically. <clears throat> so uh, the the um, uh, this this piece of fluid runs outward and drifts backward in its orbit and is further um, torqued by the um, <coughs> by the um, by the magnetic field. So this bend in the field line produces a force that's directed inward on the fluid element and uh, directed uh, forward along the uh, trajectory. And this bend in the field line produces uh, an outward force uh, and uh, a backward force. It, it uh, removes angular momentum from uh, this fluid element as this instability develops. <coughs> So there's a characteristic frequency associated with this disturbance in the field line. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, um, so uh, typically we expect that close to black holes, the um, <clears throat> the resistivity, the, the plasma is going to be fully ionized, and the resistivity is going to be sufficiently small um, that the resistive decay rate, <clears throat> which is something like eta k squared, is going to be very, very small in comparison to the other dynamical frequencies of interest, so uh, things like omega. <clears throat> Uh, you can define a, um, <clears throat> yeah, so for, uh, so black hole accretion disks are typically very, very hot, um, and uh, at least within thousands of atoms of the black hole are well coupled to the magnetic field. <clears throat> so, um, you can define a dimensionless measure of the importance of resistivity uh, by taking this to be one over h squared. <clears throat> okay, and uh, where h is the scale height of the disk. And so, um, <clears throat> uh, so h, I have to tell you more, h is cs times um, uh, sorry, CS over omega. <clears throat> and so the dimensionless number is CSH uh, over eta. So this has dimensions of a diffusion coefficient and this has two. <clears throat> and this is uh, enormous everywhere in black hole accretion disks. Now, when you go to <clears throat> far out in black hole accretion disks and the temperature um, get sufficiently low, and how low that is, is depends on exactly what the density is and so on, but probably means 
uh, thousands of Kelvin or maybe a thousand Kelvin, uh, then resistivity starts to play a role. <coughs> Um, possibly. <coughs> so um, uh, this is a situation that has been extensively considered in protoplanetary disks. And uh, yeah, if it's cold enough, it is decoupled. And there definitely are places that are too cold to interact with the magnetic field. <coughs> but then there's this uh, uh, set of uh, interactions uh, can occur um, the, that Phil talked about non-ideal uh, non -ideal terms in the induction equation. So there's not only resistivity, there's ampipolar diffusion <coughs> and Hall effect. And Hall effect, for example, can be destabilizing in certain circumstances. So it's, it's uh, hard to you know, draw a bright line. I would say that if the temperature is below 2000 Kelvin, you should worry about the how well the magnetic field is coupled to the plasma. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so um, very quickly, um, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to mention that there's a simple mechanical model of this process which doesn't involve doing linear analysis of the MHD equations. Okay, so uh, that simple mechanical model imagines uh, two masses that are in a nearly circular orbit with frequency omega <coughs> around a central body. And these masses are coupled by a spring with spring constant k. And you remember from introductory physics that that spring has a characteristic frequency <laughs> which is square root of k over m, right? Um, and uh, I'll call that characteristic frequency gamma. Okay, so, um, uh, so in this model, we're going to take these masses uh, that are very close to a circular orbit and we're going to perturb them, and then we're going to look for the modes. Okay, and the easy way to do this uh, problem is to write down a Lagrangian. Uh, so the uh, Lagrangian should be very familiar to everybody. Okay, except that I'm going to add one new term for the interaction of the two bodies via a spring. And that's going to be a potential that looks like this, <coughs> where delta is the half length of the spring. <clears throat> so this is uh, actually an exact analogy to uh, mathematical analogy to this problem. And the mathematical analogy involves sending this frequency to the wave vector of this per perturbation dotted into VA, where VA is the alphane velocity. Okay, so gamma squared is K dot VA squared. So this, these springs are magnetic fields that couple different bodies that are separated, different masses of fluid that are separated in radius. Okay, <clears throat> okay so now I'm going to set R is equal to some R0. Uh, so here, the radius of the circular orbit is R0 plus some small quantity of order epsilon. Uh, and phi... The angular coordinate is equal to some phase plus omega t, so there's a the circular orbit, um, plus y over r naught. <clears throat> so you can think of these bodies of, as being at a separation x and y from their initial point on the circular orbit. All right, <clears throat> so now uh, we say that each of these things are of order epsilon. And we expand the Lagrangian to second order in epsilon. Okay, so when you do perturbation theory, that's what you have to do. So that's, uh, what happens to the first order terms is an exercise for the students. Okay, so L2 
uh, is this. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so you can see some familiar stuff here. Um, this is just the kinetic term. Uh, this is going to give us the Coriolis force. Uh, this is related to the tidal expansion of the effective potential around the circular orbit, and this is our spring. Okay. Um, so then, Euler-Lagrange gives us uh, the equations of motion, and I'm running out of space. Okay, so we get the equations of motion, x double dot is equal to two omega y dot plus three omega squared x minus gamma squared x. Y double dot is minus two omega x dot minus gamma squared y. Okay, so this, this should look reasonably sensible to you. So here's the Coriolis term, here's tidal uh, expansion of the potential, and here's the spring. <clears throat> okay, so um, then we take, we look for the modes. <clears throat> so we set x and y proportional to e to the minus i omega t, and we'll get a dispersion relation out of this. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that gives a dispersion relation which looks like this. Okay, and I, I can't <coughs> stress strongly enough, this is exactly the MHD dispersion relation uh, when the field is vertical in the disk and when we substitute uh, K dot VA for gamma. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. <coughs> okay, and this we can solve. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can work this out in various limits. Um, but there, there are two families of modes. Uh, so one family is stable. That corresponds to one root of a quadratic equation for omega squared. Um, so if we take the small gamma limit, so gamma over omega is small, then there's a, one set of modes that uh, basically doesn't care about the spring. This is when gamma is small compared to omega. There's one set of modes that doesn't care about the spring. Uh, it just goes around in epicycles in slightly eccentric orbits. And the other has uh, omega squared is minus three gamma squared, so it's unstable. And <clears throat> you can look at the eigenvectors associated with those modes, and they involve um, the, uh, the outer body moving uh, backward, sorry, uh, yeah, moving backward in its orbit. And uh, so it's, uh, let me pull this down. The outer body moving backward, uh, the differential rotation in, in the neighborhood of this point looks like this. So if you push one of the masses outward, it falls backward in its orbit. Okay, it's the natural orientation. And so the spring pulls forward on it and adds angular momentum. But if it adds angular momentum, it wants to be in a higher orbit, right? So then it moves further out. And uh, this is a runaway process, and this is what drives the, uh, the MRI. <clears throat> okay, so again, there's a Mathematica script in the files I prepared, and it does this problem for you, so you can follow it in detail. Um, the solution, solutions to this thing look like this. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Um, and uh, <coughs> uh, down here, uh, the MRI goes away when the characteristic frequency is sufficiently uh, high compared to omega, greater than three omega, root three omega. And uh, that happens just because the spring is too strong. So the spring begins to dominate the dynamics and it just wants to sit there and oscillate and have slightly uh, uh, modes that are slightly modified by rotation. <coughs> There's a maximum uh, here at uh, 15 sixteenths where the growth rate is a maximum and the maximum growth rate is uh, three quarter omega. Okay, so <coughs> the, this is what makes the MRI good for driving turbulence in disks. It's uh, always dynamical. You can almost always adjust the wave number K so that uh, for, for given field strength, you can almost always adjust the wave number K so that you're sitting right on this sweet spot and uh, the uh, instability grows extremely rapidly, dynamically. Um, the only time when you can't do that is when the field is very strong, when it's super thermal, then these modes that sit here want to have wavelengths which exceed the scale height of the disk. So you then cannot fit the unstable modes inside the disk. Okay, so very, very strong fields can suppress MRI. <clears throat> All right. Um, so what we know, what we know now about MRI is that it induces turbulence. So I showed you the uh, the animations already. Uh, let's see. Um, so this this turbulence is is driven by the MRI. Uh, we do not understand why the MRI saturates where it does. Um, so there's some evidence from numerical simulations that uh, uh, viscosity and resistivity uh, can influence the saturation level of the MRI. Uh, there's uh, evidence that it, the saturation level, the, the relative strength of uh, the magnetic pressure and the gas pressure um, de depends on the ratio of uh, viscosity to resistivity, which is known as the Prandtl number, magnetic Prandtl number. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I think that there's also evidence that the saturation level depends on the thermodynamics of the disk, so the, the vertical entropy profile of the disk, which in turn depends on uh, energy transport uh, inside the disk. And uh, in IELTS simulations like these, I would say that there is not good evidence for convergence. Um, uh, there is not good evidence for convergence for an isothermal disk. Okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, let me try and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, expand on that a little bit. <clears throat> so if gamma squared over omega squared is greater than three, the MRI goes away. Okay, so gamma is analogous to K dot VA. Okay, so, uh, so it's for K dot VA squared over omega squared, uh, greater than three, the MRI goes away. Okay, so this is like uh, VA over lambda omega squared, where lambda is the scale of the instability. Um, and so this means uh, that for VA squared greater than about three uh, lambda squared um, omega squared, the instability will go away. And then the, uh, <coughs> the largest length scale that we have available is the disk scale height. So that means that 
for VA greater than about three and the scale height is CS over omega CS squared, um, the instability will go away. Now there, there are almost certainly other instabilities present. I mean, there's, once you have a really strong field, there's lots of ways that the field tries to rearrange itself to minimize its energy. But um, the MRI will not be one of those ways. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there's been, uh, there have been numerical studies of this. Um, the, one can look at correlation functions for, uh, say, the magnetic field, uh, and the correlated regions <coughs> uh, tend to be elongated ellipses that form trailing spirals uh, inside the disk. And uh, those ellipses, uh, the, actually, the orientation of those ellipses is well constrained. Um, it's a, uh, somewhere between uh, 10 and 20 degrees to the uh, line of constant radius. So these are very swept back spirals. <coughs> um, uh, the correlation in the, the minor axis, correlation length, tends to be very small. And that's another thing for which there's not good evidence for convergence in the numerical simulations, at least in the IELTS models. Yeah. If you put in a, okay, so I, I should back up. I'm being a little bit too pessimist, pessimistic here. Um, if you put a mean field in the disk, then uh, there is a characteristic scale and it does converge. If you don't put a mean field in the disk, as we did not over here, um, then there's no characteristic scale, and that's a situation where it, uh, you don't see convergence. Also, if you don't put a mean field in, but you do, do turn on microscopic uh, diffusion coefficients, so resistivity and viscosity, you again see convergence. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so you've hit, so we're, we're gonna relive the development of accretion disk theory in the 1970s here, but yes. So, so that is an excellent question. Uh, and you, I think what you're suggesting is that uh, the strength of the turbulence should be related to the local temperature. <clears throat> and that raises the possibility of what's called a thermal instability, where there's a runaway. Uh, so you turn up the temperature a little bit, uh, that increases the heating rate, which then increases the temperature again, and you can have a runaway. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, one of the central questions for black hole accretion disk theory is why we seem to see quiescent disks uh, it, around uh, rapidly accreting black holes when they should be unstable according to the alpha model uh, and according to recent uh, uh, radiation hydro, radiation MHD simulations of the same disks. Um, that have been, Yanfei Zhang has been a leader in this, of course. And uh, uh, those also seem to show the presence of thermal instability in even in uh, you know, ab initio model, which does not as assume an alpha model for the viscosity. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, so uh, I have one more model to do, and then I'm gonna stop with this. Um, and uh, the model is the, uh, the so-called ADAF model. So we've got Bondi, we've got thin disk, um, which uh, allows us to calculate a lot, but leans heavily on our knowledge of alpha. Uh, and we also have 
uh, so-called ADAF models. How many of you work at CFA? Okay, one, okay. Not an unusually small number of CFA people at any, you know, a typical astronomical gathering. Um, so, so Ramesh Narayan is the originator uh, with his postdoc in Suyi of these models. Um, and this acronym stands for Infection Dominated Accretion Flow. Okay, so the idea is, uh, let's see, we have Bondi, which is uh, spherically symmetric. We've got thin disk, uh, which we describe as geometrically thin and optically thick. Uh, and then we have the ADAF models, which are sort of an unholy cross of the two. And so the ADAF models look like this. Okay, so they're geometrically thick. And uh, in some cases, at very sub-Eddington rates, are optically thin. Okay, and uh, so let's imagine we turn down the accretion rate so that these things which were optically thick become optically thin. And then eventually they become incapable of cooling as fast as they're being heated by the accretion flow. So at that point, we imagine that they'll puff up and they'll become uh, really geometrically thick with H over R about one and uh, look like this. So these things are quasi-spherical but they still have some angular momentum in them. And the angular momentum still controls the accretion rate. <clears throat> okay, so, um, uh, so what's new here is that we throw away the cooling for the most part that we included here, and we turn on an advection term in the equations of motion. So, a term that looks like this. Okay, so in the thin disk models, VR is small compared to the sound speed. And so we can just neglect this. It's higher order in H over R. But in these thick disk models, H over R is of order one, and we can no longer neglect this. <clears throat> okay, so the strategy here is to write down the mass, mass conservation radial momentum equation uh, and the energy uh, equation and to uh, uh, adopt the onsats that all of the dependent variables have a power law dependence on radius. So in particular, we assume that density goes as r to the minus three halves the radial velocity goes as r to the minus one half, that the orbital frequency goes as r to the minus three halves, and that cs squared goes as r to the minus one. Okay, so we can insert these in the basic equations, uh, and what we're left with is a set of algebraic relations between the coefficients of these quantities, okay? Uh, this is a very sort of high-level gloss. But for details, there's a very clear paper by Narayan and Yi, uh, 94. <clears throat> okay, so this allows us to solve for the coefficients of these things. And for example, we find that VR is equal to minus three, over, just to give you a flavor for this, over five plus two epsilon prime alpha root GM over R. Okay, so this alpha is the same alpha that we've been discussing already. It's uh, alpha associated with turbulence in the disk. And this dimensionless coefficient depends on uh, two things. It depends on the adiabatic index of the flow and it depends on um, uh, how thoroughly we eliminate the cooling. So um, in particular, uh, the onsatz here is that 
in the energy equation, there's a term which is heating minus cooling. And the ansatz is that this is equal to some constant F times the heating rate, okay, where F goes from 0 to 1. <coughs> and, uh, and this epsilon prime, again, just to give you a sense for how this goes, is 1 over F, 5 thirds minus gamma over gamma minus 1. <coughs> Okay, so you can see that the radial velocity here is just alpha times the orbital velocity, roughly speaking. So this coefficient is of order one, typically. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so this attracted a lot of attentions. You know, this, this paper has in excess of a thousand citations. Um, and uh, there have been many variants of this proposed over the years. Uh, and uh, I would say that the language that people use now is to say that any model in which radiation is not playing a role, isn't, there's no cooling, is called a REAF, a radiatively inefficient accretion flow. So the ADAF is a special example of that. Another example of that is a model uh, generated by uh, Blanford and Bagelman called the adios model, which I think was meant to say adios to the ADAF. Uh, and adios stands for, well, this stands for advection dominated, obviously, uh, inflow outflow solution. Okay, so in these models, uh, one imagines that material is coming in in the equator and then there's a magical wind that comes off the disk, which somehow is also self-similar. <coughs> I <laughs> uh, would be happy to tell people stories about adios over beers. Uh, so there, there's a wind that comes off the disk, and this allows uh, one to uh, have a more general set of density profiles not just having density scale as r to the minus 3 halves, but having density scale somewhere between r to the minus 3 halves and let's say r to the minus 1. Okay. Uh, so in, in these models, the mass accretion rate defined as the inflow rate in the disk uh, varies with radius. Okay. I, evidently I said too little about that to enable people to ask questions. Um, so, so I think the main message is uh, that there are these geometrically thick, optically thin solutions, which are appropriate for very sub-Eddington flows. Uh, they're radiatively inefficient, meaning that uh, the entropy that's uh, uh, produced by dissipation of turbulence remains in the flow and is then carried in uh, across the event horizon at the, uh, at the end of the day. <clears throat> okay, and I have a nice uh, figure to sum this all up. This is uh, from a talk that Mitch Bagelman gave at a Solve um, conference uh, five years ago. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so th this is a, a Riesian diagram. Have any, has anyone seen Martin Riese's diagram for all the paths that make a black hole? Okay, so. So Mitch was, uh, uh, c comes from the Reese School of Astrophysics, so sums things up with a, a flow chart like this. So black hole accretion, is rotation important? If rotation is not important, we can think about Bondi flows. If it is important, we can think about uh, centrifugally choked flows or uh, centrifugally supported accretion flows. Um, by the way, uh, now I think there's something that's in between these where uh, at the outer boundary of the accretion flow, one supplies lumps of gas with a distribution of angular momenta. And uh, that material can, if, if those lumps are big enough, can make its way in in new and interesting ways. And I say that based on recent work uh, by Sean Ressler uh, and his uh, collaborators, his advisor, Elliot Quartier. Um, <clears throat> in modeling the galactic center. <clears throat>
Okay, so over here we over here we wind up with Bondi. Over here we wind up with a centrifugally choked flow, which is either radiatively efficient. So here are the reafs, uh, or uh, if it's radiatively efficient, we wind up with thin disk model. Uh, if it's uh, radiatively inefficient, it can be either quasi-Keplerian, uh, yes, in which case we wind up with an ADAF or adios, or no, in which case it's like a sphere, almost like a spherical star, um, possibly with a narrow funnel. <coughs> uh, and then in the thin disk case, uh, or the, the thick disk ADA, uh, adios case, uh, there's a question, a further question of whether the central object is spinning and whether there's strong magnetic flux, which is something I'll get to in just a second. Okay, so that this this flowchart is designed to get you to a jet, and uh, that's uh, where we go next. Okay. <clears throat> Can I get this up on the central screen? <laughs> this is not like the University of Illinois. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> um, all right, so, uh, so those are the classical phenomenological accretion flow models. Uh, so now I want to turn to numerical models, and uh, these uh, can treat either thin disks, uh, where radiation forces are important, and uh, I'll let you talk to Yanfei Zhang about those. At the moment, I'm more interested in the thick disk, very sub-Eddington models. Uh, and uh, I'll just show you uh, some simulations of, uh, of uh, a subset of our models. Um, so this uh, is a, a relativistic MHD simulation of uh, an initial uh, centrifugally supported tor initially centrifugally supported torus around a rotating black hole. Uh, and this torus has a significant amount of magnetic flux that penetrates the inner rim of the torus. And what you're going to see is the evolution of the rest mass density. Uh, so color here shows the log of the rest mass density. <clears throat> and uh, I'm about to run out of time here. I think I have 15 minutes left. So let me zip through this stuff. Oh. Okay, so it takes a little while for this to go through. This is a, a slice through the uh, poloidal plane, and this is an equatorial slice. Um, <clears throat> and this is a high magnetic flux model, which is known as a MAD model. And MAD stands for uh, magnetically arrested disk. Okay, so one of the important parameters of these models is how much magnetic flux. Uh, is trapped in the black hole. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, this would be a good opportunity to talk about this distinction between uh, magnetically dominated models and non-magnetically dominated models. So there, these fall into two classes. There are the so-called MAD models, which are magnetically dominated, and the so-called SANE models, which stands for Standard and Normal Evolution. And I credit all of these uh, acronyms to Ramesh Narayan, so you can go talk to him about if you have any complaints. So, uh, so low magnetic flux or high magnetic flux. Um, the, uh, the idea is that magnetic flux tends to be naturally advected by the flow into the black hole. And, uh, <coughs> and the flux just accumulates or, or may just accumulate there. Uh, but there's a limit to how much flux can accumulate inside the black hole. Because obviously, uh, if you have so much flux in the hole that the energy uh, vastly exceeds the binding energy of the plasma that's around uh, the black hole, then it can just blow the plasma away uh, and reach a lower energy configuration. Okay, <clears throat> so the question is, what is that? Uh, maximum flux that you can trap inside the hole. And uh, this is something that uh, Sasha Chikovskoy, who's been a pioneer uh, in this work, 
uh, can discuss with you. I think he's going to be here next, next week, later on. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> the natural calculation to do is to say, uh, we're going to be able to blow away the external plasma when the magnetic pressure uh, exceeds the ram pressure of the accreting material close to the black hole. And the ram pressure is uh, something like rho c squared. It's like the rest mass of the accreting plasma. Okay. Uh, and then we've already done this uh, estimate where we say m dot is 4 pi uh, <coughs> uh, rg squared rho c. Okay, so I'm, in making this estimate, I'm going to take this and cast it in terms of m dot instead. So I'm going to eliminate density in favor of m dot. So this is uh, m dot over 4 pi rg squared c times c squared. Okay, so this lets me <coughs> estimate um, the critical magnetic field strength in terms of the uh, mass of the black hole, which is buried in this rg, uh, and m dot. Okay, so instead of casting this in terms of a magnetic field strength, I want to cast it in terms of the uh, magnetic flux through the event horizon. Okay, so I can integrate B over hemisphere of the black hole and find out how much magnetic flux is trapped in the black hole. Okay, so some of you may worry about having magnetic flux in the hole. It's not a property of the black hole itself. We know that black holes have no hair, right? Um, but they can wear a plasma toupee. And, uh, and so these fields are supported these fields are supported by um, uh, currents in the plasma around the black hole. And uh, uh, so it's, it, this field is uh, a property of the accreting plasma rather than a property of the hole. Okay, so I want to calculate the flux, which is uh, of order Rg squared times B, because this area is of order Rg squared. <clears throat> okay, so that means that B uh, is or order phi over Rg squared. And this allows me to estimate a characteristic flux where the accretion flow can no longer trap the, the field in the hole. And I get it by substituting this in here. Um, phi over Rg squared squared is of order m dot over Rg squared C times C squared. Okay, I've dropped all factors of order eight pi. Okay, so this implies that phi is of order square root m dot Rg squared C. Okay, so this is, this is phi critical. And this leads us to define um, uh, a dimensionless magnetic flux, and I'm running out of room here. A dimensionless magnetic flux phi, which is the actual flux over the critical flux. And uh, we can only assess uh, what the maximum possible value of this is uh, by numerical experiment. So there's no analytic theory for this at the moment. And, uh, and what you find is that phi of about 15 in the right units is <laughs> the, um, the critical flux. Uh, uh, it's, it's the maximum dimensionless flux that can be sustained by the accretion flow. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I have six minutes left, and yeah. Oh, I have 36. Oh, good. <laughs>
Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. That's great. Um, so let me show you some more numerical simulations then. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, Blanford's NIAC and some open questions. Okay, so I'll put this down. Um, so this shows another uh, view of some of the simulations uh, that I just showed you. Color again here uh, is showing the log of the rest mass density, but this time on a spherical surface at 10 GM over C squared. And uh, this shows a set of uh, four different models, some of which are sane and some of which are mad. And uh, so the, the mad models have this dimensionless flux, flux of 15, and the uh, sane models have dimensionless flux around one. <clears throat> and then the spin of the black holes is either negative, so these are strongly retrograde disks, uh, or positive, so those are, those are strongly prograde disks on the other side. <clears throat> okay, so I, I want you to notice a couple things uh, about these uh, models. One is that the mad disks are really crazy. So, uh, so you can see these events where flux bubbles out through the disk and it produces low density regions at the midplane. So these are flux tubes that are uh, making their way out through the accretion flow. Uh, and let's see, there's one right there, right there. Um, again, this is just a spherical surface, so material comes out through the surface or, or can pass in through this surface. Another thing that you can see in these uh, images is that the same models tend to have, uh, well, all the models have empty regions over the poles, okay? so. Uh, obviously, I didn't say this, but it, I think it's obvious that the equator is here and the North Pole, the accretion flow, is here. Okay. <clears throat> um, so all these models have empty regions over the poles, which are known as the funnel or sometimes the, the jet or the pointing jet. And uh, uh, you can see that the funnel is wider in the MAD models than in the corresponding SANE models. So this, this kind of makes dynamical sense that uh, if uh, you have a, a strong magnetic field embedded in that funnel, uh, it can push aside the disk and make a wider, uh, wider funnel over the hole. So the field lines that are sitting in here go down into the, directly down into the black hole. They're, they don't attach to the disk. And so there's really nothing to support plasma in that uh, part of the flow. If you put plasma on that field line, it'll either go in to the black hole or go out. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the other thing that you can see is that something is making the plasma in the funnel here rotate one way or the other. And in these retrograde cases, you can see there's material at the edge of the funnel uh, here. So this is a mad strong magnetic field model. You can see the material is being dragged around in this direction while the accretion flow itself is flowing this way. Okay, and that rotation is connected to the ro directly to the rotation of the black hole. So the black hole is dragging field lines that are embedded in the event horizon with it uh, and forcing those field lines to co-rotate with the black hole. Okay, so that's the origin of the so-called Blanford's Nyack effect is dragging a field lines that pass through the event horizon by the rotation of the black hole. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, but they evolve um, on a fairly long time scale. Uh, so if you have a line decretion, then uh, you can change the spin only basically on the saltpeter time scale. That's a great, that's a good, really good question. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so 
uh, this gets back to the question of alignment of accretion flows in uh, galactic nuclei. Um, there doesn't seem to be very good evidence for alignment. Um, and so you can imagine that if the flow, the, you know, you have a disk that's accreting onto a black hole and the orientation of the disk is randomly moving around over time, that sometimes it'll be prograde and sometimes retrograde. And that the net effect over uh, very long time scales will be to despin the black hole. <clears throat> okay, so, so these are fluid flow models. And uh, let's say you had a resolved image of a black hole accretion flow, uh, then you would want to calculate what these things look like. And uh, so I, I just have to show this. Uh, so this is from Event Horizon Telescope. We built a lot of models. Uh, and uh, each of these models makes different assumptions uh, about the state of the plasma uh, in the accretion flow. So in particular, the distri electron distribution function. And that's what you need to understand the interaction between the accretion flow and the radiation field and to produce a synthetic image that you can compare with data. So one of the key questions in this field is what is the microscopic state of the plasma inside these uh, accretion flows? Is, it, uh, is the electron distribution function thermal? If it's thermal, what's the temperature? Uh, is it non-thermal? How, how do we model that? Okay. Um, yeah, I have some prettier... Um, images here. Uh, but before I talk about this, I want to um, talk about, um, actually, let me turn that back on. <clears throat> um, I, I want to talk about Blanford's Nyack effect. So um, I was going to talk about relativistic MHD. Do people want to see? So I don't have that much time left. I can't do both. Should I do relativistic MHD or should I do BZ? Line for time, yeah. Uh, right. Um, okay, so, uh, yes. Uh, so when the, um, when the accretion rate is very low in M dot, in the sense that m dot over m dot Eddington is small compared to one, we think that the accreting plasma is collisionless. <clears throat> so that means that the, the mean free path to Coulomb scattering vastly exceeds the psi, vastly exceeds RG. So in the case of uh, models for M87, it's sort of 10 to the five RG. So uh, this is the large Knudsen number regime. Uh, but this is a, also a magnetized plasma, which means that the uh, excursions of individual particles uh, perpendicular to field lines are limited by their, um, their gyro radius. Okay, so <clears throat> in two dimensions, at least, we expect that it might behave something like a fluid. Uh, along the third dimension, uh, along the field lines, one really doesn't know what to do. And uh, one approach to this is to uh, look beyond MHD and start to include non-ideal effects like heat conduction uh, and viscosity. And uh, there's some work uh, that I did with my student Mani Chandra and uh, also with uh, Francois Foucault, who's going to also be arriving tomorrow, soon, today, Monday. Okay, so with Francois Foucault uh, and, uh, uh, and Elliot Quadiert, and we looked at these sort of extended MHD models to try and assess uh, how much the flow would change. So um, the outcome of that is a little bit complicated, um, but uh, because one still needs to introduce a closure. So the idea is that you're not allowed to do absolutely anything you want with the distribution function. If you make it too anisotropic, it'll fall apart. There are insta kinetic instabilities that will re-isotropize the distribution function. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we, we had a closure model for that, which 
you know, needs to be tested in uh, kinetic simulations. Uh, but the upshot was that conduction is probably not important. And uh, viscosity can be important, um, but it turns out that the viscosity, which is this in these plasmas or in all plasmas is equivalent to uh, uh, anisotropy and the distribution function, uh, is uh, it, it behave, the viscosity behaves exactly like the Maxwell stress, the turbulent Maxwell stress. So when we do an ideal MHD simulation, we calculate one level of turbulent Maxwell stress. Uh, and when we do a viscous simulation with viscosity constrained to be along the field lines, uh, we get exactly the same stress, but part of it's viscous and the rest is Maxwell. So it's a complicated story. Yeah. Yeah, so um, what can I say about this? So for isothermal models, uh, uh, isothermal models tend to produce alpha of order 0.05. That's, alpha is just a, a scaling relation, right? Um, so it almost has to um, obtain in these shearing box models. Um, so you get a dimensional strength of the turbulence around 0.05. Uh, there's also evidence, again, that this depends on the vertical field strength. So if you put a, a vertical field into your, your box that you use to simulate this, you tend to get larger alphas. Uh, it depends on the magnetic Prandtl number. Uh, it also seems to depend on how strong um, uh, uh, convection is in the, in the disk. So there are people working now on uh, models for cataclysmic variable disks that include realistic opacities. <coughs> and uh, so cataclysmic variable disks are uh, binary systems where there's an accreting white dwarf, so with a mass losing companion. Uh, and uh, uh, those um, disks seem to produce a variable alpha depending on what the temperature of the disk is, so how convective it is. When it's more convective, uh, alpha tends to be higher. When it's less convective, alpha tends to be lower. <clears throat> so you have but again, there's, there's always worries about convergence in these species. So don't tell anyone I told you that alpha is 0.05, because I didn't. Okay, um, so Blanford's Nyack. Um, so, um, so we've already done uh, the limiting magnetic flux <coughs> and uh, Now we want to ask what happens when you embed that magnetic flux in a rotating black hole. And this is uh, a problem that was first considered by Blanford and Znayek uh, 1977. So I think many of you know that Penrose considered methods of extracting energy from a rotating black hole in the late 60s. Um, Blanford and Znayak were the first to, I think, propose an astrophysically realistic uh, scheme for getting energy out of a rotating black hole. <coughs> and uh, Blanford and Znayak considered a force-free model. So force-free here means that uh, the density is very low but it's not so low that we're in the vacuum electromagnetism regime. So uh, there are still charges around that can carry currents. 
Uh, and that means we're, we're still in a regime where the ideal MHD condition applies. So ideal MHD relates E and B. It says that E is uh, minus V cross B on C. Okay, so it takes the number of degrees of freedom in the field from six down to three. Okay, and uh, uh, so this is a relativistic version of that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> yeah, so J cross B is zero, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so what Blanford Zaznayak did was say, let's uh, look at a field configuration for a non-rotating black hole. Okay, so Schwarzschild, and we're gonna use a monopole configuration. Okay, so field is just coming out. And if you wanna make this more realistic, you can uh, use a split monopole where it goes in in one hemisphere and out in the other and then don't worry about what happens in the equator. Okay, <clears throat> so, uh, so the idea was to um, <clears throat> uh, spin this up and do an expansion of the equations governing the magnetic field in the limit that the spin of the black hole is small compared to one. Okay, and that's the analytic hook that lets you get a solution. Um, so uh, the equations that you solve um, are the source-free Maxwell equations and the uh, stress energy conservation. So uh, uh, this is actually why I was gonna do re relativistic MHD first, because this makes more sense. But you have source-free Maxwell, so uh, the induction of uh, the equation. And, uh, and then you have a divergence of t mu nu is equal to zero. <clears throat> so these allow you, these two equations allow you to evolve the uh, magnetic field in this force-free approximation in the, the magnetosphere around the black hole. Okay, so this is a mathematically challenging task uh, for which you need an understanding of poly logarithms. But uh, the, I think the, it's really a, a simple idea, which is that you have uh, magnetic field lines embedded in a rotating body. And uh, when the body rotates, it drags the field lines with it and that causes energy to be carried away from the rotating body. Okay, so we can estimate how big uh, this is, how big the energy flux is, and we're gonna call that the Blanford's Nyack luminosity. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, the way we do that is to take the uh, pointing flux uh, at the surface of the black hole, okay, and uh, uh, LBZ is gonna be equal to the pointing flux times RG squared. I should twiddle that, no, it's not equal. Okay, so that begs the question, what's the pointing flux? Okay, so MHD pointing flux, um, so we know that uh, pointing flux is equal to C over four pi E cross B, right? And uh, we also know that E is minus V cross B on C in the ideal MHD approximation. Um, so this is C over four pi uh, minus uh, V cross B over C cross B. And then with the aid of some identities, we can rewrite this as B squared V uh, minus uh, V dot B B over four pi, okay? And uh, the piece that's relevant here at the event horizon is not this piece because the VR is actually inward on the horizon, it has to be inward on the horizon. So we'll consider this piece, 
okay? And we'll say that the velocity at the event horizon is just rotation, okay? So there's, a, there's a uh, rotation frequency. <coughs> and I don't want to completely erase this because I'm going to need that in a second. Um, there's a rotation frequency, so we need s is uh, v dot b b, which is of order r g omega <coughs> uh, times b phi times b r. And I'm doing this all in a totally Newtonian view, okay? So when the thing isn't rotating, the field is entirely radial. When uh, we turn on rotation, we get a little bit of B phi out, right? So that allows me to estimate, uh, this is RG, and then omega is uh, A times T cubed over GM. This is just one over TG, the characteristic time scale, light crossing time. Okay, so, uh, and then B phi, is just, we'll just say it's of order A times BR. <clears throat> okay, well, on the idea that when uh, A is zero, B phi is zero, when I turn on A, the uh, at lowest order in A, we begin to get a B phi. Okay, so this gives me a uh, uh, full expression for the pointing flux it's just a squared, and then this times this gives me c, times c, times br squared. Okay, this, I, I'm sorry this is so hand wavy, but actually doing this rigorously is a mess. Uh, okay, so this gives us the pointing flux here, and then we can finish this estimate. So what we get there um, <clears throat> is uh, a squared c b squared uh, times rg squared. Okay, so that's the blanford nyack luminosity. Okay, so now let's try and connect that. So this is, right now this just tells us that it's related to the magnetic field strength. But we know, uh, at least for most of the, the SANE and MAD models that we've looked at, that the magnetic field strength is connected to the accretion rate, right? And in fact, it's connected through this characteristic um, uh, value for the accretion rate. So what I'm going to do is write B in terms of the magnetic flux, and then I'm going to write the magnetic flux in terms of this dimensionless flux phi and this characteristic magnetic flux. Okay, so let's carry out that program. So I still have my A squared out front. I have C and then B is phi times phi crit over RG squared squared um, times RG squared. <clears throat> okay, so um, phi crit squared, let me, okay, so phi crit squared is RG squared M dot C, okay, uh, so this is, okay, and then, uh, uh, let's see, I'm missing, uh, no, I'm, I'm good, uh, times RG squared divided by RG fourth. Okay, that's RG fourth, RG squared, and RG squared there, so all the RGs go away. Okay, now at the end we get A squared, phi squared, M dot C squared. Okay, <clears throat> so this tells you that the uh, Blanford's Nyack luminosity is proportional 
to the accreted rest mass energy and that the efficiency is directly related to the square of the spin and the ratio of this magnetic flux to the critical magnetic flux. <clears throat> um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So if you look at the simulations uh, I showed a little earlier, you can see that the, the funnel plasma is rotating backwards in one case and forwards in the other case. Um, and the rotation frequency of the field lines in the, in the funnel is actually directly related to this. It's, it's directly proportional to the spin. Does that, there's something that's bothering you clearly that I'm not. Um, yeah, so the, so, right, so the critical magnetic flux, the, the dimensionless magnetic flux, which is the maximum possible value, is actually slightly different in the two cases. It's slightly lower in the, in the retrograde case, retrograde case, yeah. Um, but that, I haven't made any assumptions about that here. So phi is what phi is. Yeah, it's, uh, well, if that were true, then we wouldn't see pulsars. Um, so, so the, the, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think that the answer to that rests on uh, unsolved, unresolved problems about what happens to these pointing jets as they propagate outward. And uh, there are a couple of things that could happen. So one thing that could happen is that the field lines could be loaded by various pair production processes with electron-positron pairs. Another thing that could happen is that uh, plasma from the surrounding medium could diffuse in uh, to the pointing jet. And then a final thing that could happen is that you might have a shock uh, which again induces some um, uh, pair production, uh, which uh, produces pairs that can then radiate. So uh, ultimately, um, we may recover a substantial fraction of the energy. Yeah, so in the case of, just to give you a concrete example, um, the, uh, the X-ray luminosity of M87 right now is about, if, if I remember correctly, about 10 to the 41 ergs per second. And uh, the uh, jet luminosity, if it is a pointing jet like this, uh, then this is relevant, uh, is greater than 10 to the 42 ergs per second. So, um, and, and that's estimated in, in a number of different and very equally inaccurate ways. Uh, so uh, one way people uh, estimate the, uh, the time averaged uh, luminosity of the jet is by asking how much PDV work does the jet have to do to ex excavate the observed cavity in the uh, intercluster or intergalactic medium and, uh, uh, and then divide that by a lifetime for the jet. And uh, that produces estimates for the the jet power, which are actually substantially above 10 to the 42. So some of this uh, energy may go into excavating a cavity. Uh, some may go into radiation, um, depending on how the jet is loaded. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Yeah. Um, so uh, there, that's a really interesting problem. Uh, Matthew Liska has uh, recently produced some interesting simulations of misaligned uh, disks. Uh, I should back up a second and just say what the classical theory of the misaligned disks is. So there's something called the Bardeen-Pedersen effect, uh, which is uh, uh, Jim Bardeen, uh, not John Bardeen. And uh, uh, that uh, makes the observation that uh, if you think about the accretion disk as a series of rings that, uh, that are tilted uh, out of the equatorial plane, then each of those rings will precess uh, due to lens tearing effect. And uh, the precession rate will depend strongly on radius. And so that will wrap up the warp with radius. And then if there's any sort of dissipative coupling between neighboring rings, uh, and you can wait long enough, then those rings will settle into a common equatorial plane where they're not processing anymore. So uh, how that happens depends on how that coupling occurs and what waves are present that also might uh, excite uh, tilt or cause tilt of the disk to the decay or be carried uh, away. <clears throat> so, um, there's an idea, going back to the bardeen pedersen paper, that the disk will naturally align everywhere inside a characteristic radius, which is called the bardeen pedersen radius. Uh, uh, and then this theory has been revisited again and again over the years. Uh, have you done something on that, Phil? I, everybody, everybody's worked on that. Uh, it's a really interesting problem. And uh, uh, I, I would say that the the outcome is not yet clear, um, that there's a suggestion that uh, the behavior of the disk depends on the ratio of alpha to the dimensionless thickness of the disk to h over r. So that's um, who, who did that stuff. Is that Pavloisa and Pringle probably, yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and then there have been simulations. So only recently has it been possible to do this in MHD simulations. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, a recent example is um, Matthew Liska's work. Uh, Matthew Liska's work suggests um, that there actually is gradual alignment even of a thick disk and that the jet emerges perpendicular to the disk and not along the spin axis of the black hole. So you can think of these pointing jets as like, they're very light, right? They, they are light. Um, and, uh, and so they're easy to deflect. Uh, so it's kind of natural to think that it emerges perpendicular to, even to a tilted disk. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a problem with that? <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, you know, that, that's because the tilted models are really expensive and uh, not yet fully understood. So, you know, it, it increases the dimension of the parameter space by two, um, and that makes things really hard. So, so I think the, the real reason it was ignored was practical. Uh, but if I had to make an excuse for that, I would say that um, there, there really isn't uh, good evidence for precession of the jet. Um, at least if you go far enough out, the jet seems to have been aligned in the same direction for an extended period of time. Okay. I'm kind of talked out. Happy to talk. I'm here for uh, for another two weeks. <laughs>